So first, I'd just like to recap the Rock Region Metro mission, which is to provide safe, reliable, convenient, and cost-effective transit service with a skilled team of employees that are dedicated to our customers' needs and committed to excellence. Um, a little bit about our governance. We, have, um, we are our own transit authority. So just like the airport is its own authority or the Little Rock Port Authority, we're our own authority, and we are governed by a 12-member board of directors, and the directors are appointed by the top elected officials of the jurisdictions that we serve. So that would be Little Rock, North Little Rock, and Pulaski County, and then also Maumelle and uh, Sherwood. We also have a very talented, hardworking, smart management team. And so a few of those folks are on the screen there tonight. And then we have more, of course, um, on our team who, who run the um, operations every day, including uh, Justin Avery, who's on the top left there. He is our chief executive officer. This is a map of the Little Rock urbanized area and the, and the Conway urbanized area as determined by the US Census. The Little Rock area is in green, and as you can see, it's more than just Little Rock. It's Little Rock, Benton, Bryant, Maumelle, Jacksonville, Sherwood. And then um, Conway, as you can see, and probably you're familiar with this if you've ever driven down I-40, it's just far enough away and has a dip in population density along that track where there's basically farmland on either side. And it surpassed 50,000 people in the last few years, which means that it gets its own urbanized area as determined by the U.S. Census um, and so that made it eligible for federal public transit dollars. And so that's why we were able to bring you this service tonight and talk about that. It's because that was a recent development in the last few years in Conway. And um, just a, a quick note here, the, I always say it's determined by the U.S. Census because um, all uh, public transit agencies are overseen by the Federal Transit Administration or the FTA. And the FTA actually has no um, jurisdiction over determining the urbanized area map. That is the jurisdiction of the U.S. Census. Okay, so a little history on our background with uh, Conway. In 2018, we became the designated recipient of Conway's FTA 5307 urbanized area form formula funds. And um, that was made as a joint decision with Conway um, because they had, uh, again, uh, surpassed 50,000 people and were eligible for these dollars. We are the, the state's largest public transit agency. There are actually seven other small urban public transit agencies across the state, but we're the biggest, and we're serving what is arguably the only urban core in Arkansas. Um, so the funds remain with Metro, but they cannot be used on anything but Conway Transit projects or Conway Transit-oriented development projects. And in 2019, Rock Region Metro developed our first microtransit zone and that would be the John Barrow Road Zone in Little Rock. And so after we started that service and saw how popular it was, um, it was determined um, with Conway, when we first started working with Conway, we were, looking in, we were looking into a van pool program, and they saw how successful the microtransit program was, and they decided that they had wanted to launch that and with their public transit dollars. And so we began working with them in 2021 to launch this program and plan for it using CARES Act funding. So part of the um, eligibility that made Conway eligible for the federal public transit dollars also meant that during the pandemic, when all public transit agencies were given CARES Act funding to keep service up, uh, Conway was eligible for that as well. So right now we're starting it with CARES Act funding, but eventually um, over the next few years that funding will run out. It's one-time funding. It has to be used for specific things related to public transit through the pandemic, and it is um, not going to last forever. So in the future, this will need to be a budget line item because in order for Conway to keep drawing down those 5307 federal public transit funds, they have to provide a, a local match of funding. And so when we talk about fares for this service later on this evening, some of the fares that people pay to ride this service will offset what Conway owes as far as that, that budget. Um, but it is a public transit service. It's not private transit service. And the 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 intention of public transit service is to operate like any other public service that we enjoy here in this country. So it's sort of like public schools. Those are funded and heavily subsidized by the government. And the same concept applies to public transit. I heard um, an interview on the radio this morning, um, some people talking about well, how can they make money off this program? It's not a money-making pro program. It's a public service program, and that's why public transit exists.
So some benefits of this partnership are that um, we're engaging in a somewhat familiar um, structure of transit service. It's ride hailing and ride sharing, and many people may be familiar with similar services out there in the private sector. So there's some familiar, familiarity there about how the service works. And it's also using our experience as the state's largest agency in managing highly robust um, and technical FTA regulations. And it also establishes Central Arkansas's first public transit service outside of Pulaski County and lays the foundations for the region's multimodal network. So a little bit more information about microtransit. Microtransit's a ride hailing, ride sharing, point to point accessible public transit service using smaller vehicles to get from point A to point B. It's really ideal for areas of either low or emerging transit demand. Here in this market, I would say it's more of an emerging transit demand. And that was pretty clear from all of the excitement that we've seen in the community about the service coming. Um, it's also technology driven in a way that other transit service maybe isn't um, necessarily to that degree because it requires a software system to run the service. The software is putting together on-demand ride requests into an algorithm and um, telling our operators where to go from point to point. Um, and it's familiar for anyone who has ever used a transportation network company such as Uber or Lyft. It's um, similar but not exactly the same as Uber Pool. Most people in Arkansas have not used Uber Pool. When I've just been out in the community talking to people, Uber Pool is, um, I'll give you an example. I used it when I was at the Denver airport. If anybody's ever been out to the Denver airport, you know that all the hotels that are right there are actually kind of far removed from the proper downtown of Denver. And I didn't have a car. I just flown in there and I wanted to um, spend, uh, you know, an evening in the downtown Denver area grabbing a meal before I caught a very early flight back home the next day. So I just scheduled a trip on Uber Pool and the fare was cheaper because I was sharing my ride. And the other rider was already in the car when it pulled up and he had come from another hotel that was just down the strip of all the hotels that are out there near the airport. So that's kind of how that works. Um, it, this is a service that offers more coverage than a traditional fixed route bus service. When I say fixed route bus service, it's like the big buses that you see in Little Rock and North Little Rock. And the reason is they're smaller vehicles. They can go on these smaller residential roads and weave through traffic and just go places where you can't take a 35 or 40 foot bus. Um, so they're a little bit more practical for smaller areas of the city and they can go further. Um, and then it's more immediate service and it's more responsive than traditional dial a ride service that you might have seen in other communities where you dial in and schedule a ride. Um, and that's, again, the advent of technology has really um, made the service really work more efficiently and just explode in popularity. Some of the things that distinguish this service from a company that's, that's like an Uber or Lyft is that um, they're shared rides. That's the intention. It's not intended to ever be an individual ride. That's why it's subsidized by public mass transit funding. So it's a shared ride and it's also, um, we have a dedicated purpose specific fleet to operate that service. Um, whereas if you're using a private company, you may not know what type of vehicle is coming to pick you up. Could be an SUV, could be a sedan, you really don't know. Um, and then you, unless you're paying a premium to, for a specific bigger vehicle. Um, and then it also has predictable fares. So just like if there was a concert going on tonight in Conway, um, there wouldn't be surge pricing using this service. It's going to be the same fee until um, we revisit the fare structure, which we may do in the future. That's a possibility. But it, it will be, if that has happens, we will come and do public meetings about that as well. Okay. A little bit more about paratransit, ser uh, microtransit service, sorry is that it can um, serve a variety of trip purposes. For this market, it's, it's really being used for that top bullet point, which is local circulation. It's circulating mainly within the bounds of this city. Um, this is a map, and um, after this meeting, you're welcome to come and take a closer look at it, but this is a map of what the service area is, which is roughly along the lines of the city boundaries. And so it's circulating from any point in that green area to any other point in the green area. And, um, but it's also a service that has been used by different public transit agencies for different purposes. So, for example, some people use it to be a circulator service to feed into park and ride lots for then commu bigger commuter shuttles that might go down the highway to another city. Um, and then it's also used for gap service. So if you have somebody working at a factory and they have a late night shift or an early morning shift, 
it could be used to, to fill in supplemental service before buses start running in some communities. Um, it's also really great for gauging demand for transit service and, and for different types of service. So for example, here, um, it, it's using real data with the software. So every origin uh, address and every destination address is captured by this software. So we're able to more specifically pinpoint what areas in the city or in the zones, if it, the case may be in Little Rock and North Little Rock, of where people are wanting to go and use the service and what the hotspots truly are. Versus if you're walking up to a transit stop using a bigger bus, you really don't know exactly where someone's coming from. You might know that they're coming to that stop, but you don't know where they're coming from and what their ultimate destination is. So um, this can also help us predict some patterns and see if there are some patterns emerging where you might have a corridor, for example, here in Conway that becomes so popular that maybe it does warrant having a fixed route bus and having a more traditional bus route in that area. Okay, um, a little bit more about the service design for the Metro Connect Conway service. This was developed with our professional transit planning company that's named Foursquare ITP. They do um, projects like this for public transit agencies across the country. And then um, it was also used, we, we did data simulations within the software that we're using for this service, and that is called Transloc. Loc is short for location, so it's Transloc, not Lock. And it's a subsidiary of Ford Mobility. And Ford Mobility is connected to the Ford company that we all know uh, as the maker of cars. Um, and we also developed this plan with continued input from the City of Conway staff, um, some of whom are with us tonight and have been working on this project for a long time with us. Um, and we also um, worked with their planners and our planning team looking at different um, data resources to do this planning. We talked about um, trip generators, which in the transit world is just a fancy word for places where people want to go. Shopping centers, hospitals, public libraries, academic institutions, places like that. Um, we also looked at uh, traffic analysis zones. So you may have heard the term metro plan thrown around if you're following uh, news here in Conway. Metro plan is the metropolitan planning organization for a four county area that includes Faulkner County. And um, Metro Plan collects uh, traffic analysis zones data, and um, that's what they do. They share it back with the jurisdictions for planning purposes, just like this. So we look, and we'll, and we'll look at a map here in a minute of where those traffic patterns are. But we also um, looked at other population um, or other data, such as population density, employment density, um, land use, and populations. So I'll walk you through a couple of those maps here in a minute. And finally, we um, vetted and refined this service plan by hosting a series of meetings last November with stakeholders from the, specifically from Conway, from the business sector, from the health sector, academic, and social services sectors. Um, and, and the city um, staff helped us collect names and, and make contact with some of the different organizations that we met with to talk to them about this service. So a couple of those maps that I mentioned that I just wanted to walk you through of um, some of the data that we collected to plan this service. Um, you know, one of the strongest predictors of transit use is density. That's not always the case. And of course you have different degrees of density and then you have um, an array of services, if you will, in the transit world now that you can deploy for different levels of density. Um, so, you know, in Little Rock, we have the bigger Little Rock um, buses and Little Rock and North Little Rock, the fixed route buses, because of, we have some very dense areas of the cities um, where they make a lot of sense. Here in um, Conway, the areas that you see that are yellow and orange are the most dense areas out of the city. And you can see that all these little black marks on the map, it may be harder to see from the back there, those are just little marks indicating um, uh, trip generators. So those places that we mentioned before, like hospitals and schools and libraries and uh, medical clinics and social services organizations, municipal buildings, things like that where people want to go. Um, so that was part of the research. We also looked at um, key metrics of demographics. So there are a couple of different subgroups that have a higher propensity for using public transit service, including zero vehicle households, um, people who have disabilities, uh, low income individuals, youths who are too young to drive, and senior citizens. And so this is a map showing concentrated areas of where you find people who are in those profiles collectively. Um, the, the more you find is the darker the color with the red. We also looked at um, land use. 
you can't have a conversation about public transit without talking about land use. And any anybody who's uh, worked in planning um, for the city or the county um, understands this. But basically, you, you um, find a higher percentage of people using transit trips in places where there are um, apartment complexes, for example, multifamily housing. Um, also, academic institutions, medical institutions. You're going to hear this a lot. This is kind of, I sound like a broken record because these are all the places that generate more transit use. And you'll see that these are the areas that they're concentrated in if you look on the map um, with the yellow and orange and red. And then finally, we looked at travel patterns. And I think um, most everybody on the planning team is from central Arkansas, and a lot of us have lived here um, our whole lives. Of course, our planning team is based in Massachusetts, so um, they're looking at it from an outsider perspective. But I think all the people in um, Arkansas who were on the team were kind of surprised to see that the strongest travel patterns are not necessarily um, between Little Rock and Conway, for example, which I think is a lot of people here in this market think that. And we see, you know, peak travel time when it's at the end of the workday or the beginning of the day, and we think that that's the strongest pattern. But really, the strongest patterns are within Conway itself. And you can see here with the bolder lines that are, you know, in red, those are the strongest patterns. Um, I'm not from Conway. My granddad was here, and I, I grew up visiting him probably once a week. But I know that... Um, on that area, there's a lot of shopping centers and stuff um, on that side of the map, on the east side of town. So um, you guys uh, probably know the city best and know what some of those places are that show the strongest patterns. But, you know, it's kind of activities of daily life, shopping, grocery shopping, things like that. So um, these are some of the things that went into the um, service design. Um, from the perspective of the actual app, um, from the rider's perspective, this app and this service offers easy booking. So you book the rides through an app. You can use a, a dial-in phone number if you don't have a smartphone. So we, we do make that available, but it's really easy. And I encourage you, if, um, if you're considering doing the dial-in, to if you do have a smartphone, to actually use the app because you can allow your phone to give you push notifications. And it'll tell you things like your, your vehicle's 10 minutes away, it's 8 minutes away, it's 5 minutes away, it's 3 minutes away, it's here. Um, which is nice. Um, and you, you do have to allow the push notifications though to get that. So we'll talk about that here in a minute. But um, it will give you real-time vehicle information. And then it also offers reasonable wait and travel times, which we'll talk about here in a minute, and also affordable fares. So um, the wait and travel times for this service are really a function of how many vehicles that you have in circulation within the zone and then the service zone size itself and, and the average trip length. Um, lucky for you guys, Conway is not really geographically spread too far over an area, so it's pretty compact, actually, um, compared to some cities that are out there. So um, we're able to keep that um, service, um, wait, the total wait and travel time uh, pretty reasonable by having two vehicles in service. So they will be, um, there will be two vehicles in service Monday through Saturday, 6 a.m. to 8 p.m., so 14-hour spans of service for six days a week. And um, again, this was all determined, the, the zone was actually determined in this map that you see here um, by all the factors that we just discussed and all those other maps and, and demographics and information. So again, this service will be offered from any point within the green area on this map to any other point, including the points that aren't labeled on the map, such as maybe your house or your apartment. Um, we didn't have enough space to label every single point that, that would be on this map, but it's a, it's a trip from any point in the zone to any other point in the zone. Okay, so um, when we took this and simulated the service, um, we, we did a simulation for up to 100 passenger trips a day using the two vehicles in this specific zone, and we came up with a simulation that gave us an average wait time of less than 30 minutes and an average trip time of less than 20 minutes. Sometimes it could be much less than that. It kind of depends on the length of your trip and how far you're going within this zone. And it also depends on the time of day and how many other people are trying to book trips at the same time. But the simulation kind of, um, you know, simulates different scenarios and different trips to give us this information. Um, once the ridership demand reaches 100 passenger trips per day and sort of starts to surpass that, we can adjust as necessary. Um, a couple of different ways that you can adjust are to add more vehicles, which is everyone's favorite option because it means more service. 
but you could also introduce things like distance-based pricing, which may not be as popular, but you know, if you're going a little bit further, let's say, and it's over five miles, maybe there's an extra fee that goes on top of that because it's a further, it's a longer trip that's costing more fuel and, and um, time and things like that. There's also another way you can do this, which is to shrink the zone um, geographically. Um, we're not talking about that now. We're hopeful that we um, are going to take a minute to get to 100 passenger trips per day before we have to have this good problem to have, and um, we will deal with it at that point. But there is always the option, if the city is willing, to um, purchase some more vehicles, to add some more vehicles to that. But again, this is something that the city has never budgeted before in the past. So um, I'll just ask that everybody be mindful and, and easy on the city leadership because this will be new for them and this will be a new budget line item in the, in the coming years. Um, and I will say that we have had supply chain issues in the transit industry, just like everybody. I was just listening to a story on the radio on the way over here about cars and, you know, computer trips for cars. And just like it's affecting the, you know, the personal vehicle market, it's affecting transit as well. So um, we've had um, some issues that have actually delayed the launch of this service because of the uh, delivery of vehicles. And I know the city of Conway has been waiting for their own municipal vehicles for different services as well. Um, hopefully we'll be coming out of that in 2023, but that does affect how quickly we could be adding vehicles potentially to this service in the future. Um, some different ways that Metro is supporting this service is that we'll have at least four drivers, um, possibly more. It could be a combination of full-time, part-time. You know, we have to have driver have, drivers are human beings. They have to have sick days and vacation days and everything else. So in order to keep two vehicles in service, this is what um, we're predicting as far as the labor with that. We're also going to have a dedicated supervisor and a dedicated dispatcher. And um, those, those folks will be um, out the dispatcher will help, um, you know, be in communication with the drivers, get them any needs. The supervisor's there if anything happens. You know, things happen to cars that we drive just like they happen to your car. You could have a flat tire. Things do happen in the transit world. Um, we're all driving on the same city streets that you guys are and, and using the same sort of technology as far as um, driving. So um, things do happen. So that's why the supervisor will be on staff to help with all of that. And we also have our fixed cost support, which is just everybody in the background helping with things like operations management, human resources, accounting, public engagement, um, like we're doing tonight, legal um, needs that we have tied to it. All of those things are um, back, back of the house supporting uh, features. We also have some capital expenses. Obviously, the biggest one is the vehicles themselves. Um, and we, we do own the vehicles um, as Metro. Um, and we will maintain those vehicles. We also have computers, um, software, radio, signage, things like that. Um, this is an image of what the vehicles look like. They are 2022 Lone Star ProMaster 3500s. So they're bigger vans. Um, they can accommodate up to seven people, um, and they can also accommodate people using wheelchairs. They're low floor uh, vehicles, and they have this fold-out wheelchair ramp on the side, as you can see. Um, and they're, again, going to be two service vehicles, two in service at any given time, and they'll be owned, maintained, fueled, and insured by Rock Region Metro, and they're going to be kept in the metro facilities in North Little Rock at the end of every day, and we'll come out here in the morning um, and get the service started here in Conway, but they'll be fueled um, here at, uh, we've worked out an agreement with the city of Conway to fuel them at the same place where all the municipal vehicles get fueled here, so... Um, we actually just went out to visit that site yesterday, so that'll be good for us to keep those fueled up. And this is what they will look like when they're wrapped. So this is just, the they'll be wrapped in the Metro Connect brand, and they'll also have a special brought to you by Conway um, sign on there, and also the Conway City logos you can see there, so you'll be able to recognize them as being the Metro Connect vehicles when they pull up. The fare structure is um, going to be $2 per person per trip. Um, this is a subsidized, affordable, easy to remember flat fee. Um, and there are two ways that you'll be able to pay. You can either use exact cash in the fare box, so two $1 bills, or you can pay through the token transit app that Metro has. It's a free app that you can download on the Google Play or Apple Store, and it's easy to use, and it's just a virtual app. Um, you're not going to be able to find it right now because we're not launching the service yet. So not some, there's not going to be a fare in there yet for Metro Connect Conway, but there will be by the launch date. Um, 
So this is a fee that is comparable. We, we did a fair study and we looked at other cities and other states and what they were charging for their microtransit service. This is actually the cheapest of all of the rates that we looked at. So it's, it's very reasonable. And, um, you know, fares have a relationship to transit usage in that the higher your fares, the lower your ridership. The lower your fares, the higher your ridership. So it's always kind of a delicate balance as to what to charge for transit. And again, um, we may find that if it's so popular that it's going to, you know, degrade the service overall, we may have to make some adjustments. So um, again, if we do have to adjust in the future, we'll be monitoring that and assessing and providing information about how we do that. But those would um, trigger a series of public information to, meetings to discuss that. Um, and the good news is that for the first roughly one, one month when we launch this service, which will launch on Monday, October 24th, we're going to start with fare-free rides up until Sunday, uh, November 20th. And then um, starting Monday, November 21st, you'll uh, be paying a fare to ride. And that's just to get everybody used to using the service and, and seeing how it works and if it's going to work for them. And uh, just a note, I was asked at the last meeting if you can buy somebody else a ride. Um, the Token Transit app also has a website, it's tokentransit.com. You can go there, and if you know the other person's 10-digit smartphone number, you can enter their number, pay for a pass. Um, the site is encrypted. It's just like buying a sweater online. And the person that you're sending the pass to will get a text notification prompting them to download the Token Transit app and use that pass that they can just show to the driver. Okay, so um, this slide, uh, we've kind of checked off all the boxes here. Um, we recruited all the folks, we've hired and trained people, we have the vehicles in place. We're doing the second of two public outreach meetings. Right now we're um, doing some of those behind the scenes operational tasks. And then um, we're also going to be in the next few weeks and even after we launch the service, working with different groups here in the community to help train anybody who needs help um, using the app and learning how to use the service. So, um, you know, if you have like a senior, senior citizens group that you would like us to come meet with, we're happy to do that, or veterans groups or, you know, individuals with disabilities, we can come out and work with whoever your point person is to have a day to just come and help them download the app and get used to using the app and show them how it works. And here at the end of this meeting here in just a minute, I'm gonna pull up the app on my phone and just kind of give you an overview of what it looks like right now. So um, as after the launch of the service, um, at some point after we've had a few months under our belts, we'll be issuing a rider survey and we're gonna try to do these on a pretty regular basis just to see how the, the service is going for people, how they're liking it, you know, any feedback that they wanna give us. We'll be monitoring the service, you know, how many passenger trips do we have, on what days are the most popular, what time of day is the most popular, where are we starting to maybe get to the danger zone of surpassing 100, 100 passenger trips per day, um, all of that. And we'll be providing regular financial reporting to Conway um, because these are, again, being uh, their CARES Act funding dollars are being used to launch this service. So as we move along, those funds are going to dwindle and we'll be giving them updates on all of that. Um, and again, um, just, just so everyone knows, um, you, you can, uh, these funds are, are the Conway funds that are being used, the, the CARES Act funds, and in the future when they have to provide that local funding match, usually um, that draws down additional you know, federal funding. Um, so it kind of depends on what you're applying it to as to what that match is. Somebody asked me a question yesterday, and usually for vehicles, for example, it's a 15% local match, and then the feds pay for 85%. So it's a really great way to invest your dollars in a service. Um, that's, that's a good community service that's needed. Um, but it does cost money. Transit's not cheap. But, you know, it's a worthwhile endeavor. And for right now, um, it's easy because it's free almost with CARES Act funding. But it is taxpayer funding. I was asked that question by an elected official yesterday. <laughs> and it is taxpayer funding right now. It's your federal tax taxpayer dollars right now with the CARES Act. And eventually it will be mixed in with your local funding dollars and taxpayer dollars. Um, a couple of uh, notes uh, before I move on to just showing you how the app works. You can book what we call subscription trips. So if you work Monday through Friday and you want to leave your house at a certain time and try to be at work by a certain time and you want to have a standing appointment, 
um, you can do that. And then you can book your st standing appointment trip to come back from work back to your house at the end of the day. Um, you can do that in the app. No, that's not a problem. The only thing that we ask is that you remember that when Thursday Thanksgiving rolls around, that you cancel that trip ahead of time if you're not going to be going to work on Thanksgiving. So we don't send out a driver who's waiting on you and you're a no-show. Um, we were also asked yesterday about whether there is a wait time policy, and there is. Um, if you're not at your place and the driver has waited up to five minutes, they're going to have to leave to get um, make sure that they're picking up the next person and trying to stay on schedule for everyone else. So there is that wait time policy. Um, and finally, as I'm pulling up the app to show you guys how it works, um, I, I got a few questions yesterday after the main presentation, and I'll just say that, you know, the future of, you know, there were questions about expanding and things like that which will be great to do, but I'll just remind you that we're, we're a transit authority, but we don't have a local long-term dedicated funding source that's earmarked for public transit, even in Little Rock and North Little Rock, for example. So we're not, you know, like your public schools here probably operate off earmarked money from a property tax maybe or a sales tax. We don't have that. And we're not the people that, that determine that. Um, we all collectively, as people who um, are hopefully registered voters, and um, engaged in our civic processes, we manage that process by who we vote into um, place and how they spend those public dollars. So I'll just say that if you're interested in it expanding um, and you want it to go outside this city jurisdiction, the next jurisdiction up would be the Faulkner County jurisdiction. You know, um, so when you, when you want to talk about the value of public transit, the people that you need to be talking to are your ward representative, your mayor, your justice of the peace, your county judge, your state rep, your state senator, Congressman Hill, Senator Bozeman, and Senator Cotton. Those are the people who determine what level of public transit investment is for right here. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up this app and show you guys just how it works. All right, let me pull it up there. Okay, it, the app, these are all my work apps, and in the bottom right-hand corner, you see this gray app with the white um, little transit vehicle. It looks like a front of a bus or a van. That is the Transloc app. You'll just open up that app, and you can see I'm already on the on-demand um, page, which is this bottom row of icons. It starts with routes. We don't run any of our fixed routes in Little Rock or North Little Rock off the Transloc app. We run those off a totally different app. So you can just ignore the routes uh, button. What you want is on demand. And then there's a search and then a, a me button in settings. So it's pretty kind of standard looking menu setup. You can see that right now it's on the East Little Rock weekday zone. You can just swipe or tap over here at the bottom to go to the second zone that's popping up. Eventually, you're going to see all these names that you don't recognize because these are all Little Rock and North Little Rock zones. And so eventually, you're going to want to go to the Metro Connect Conway zone. Um, and you can see for this zone that I have pulled up, the John Barrow weekday zone, it says weekday. Um, if I click over again, I can find, um, well, let's see. Yes, there it is. I can click over and not, now you can see I, see I have the John Barrow weekend zone. So you'll, you'll want to make sure that when you're booking rides that you, if it's on a Monday and you want to book the ride for a Monday, that you're on the weekday zone and not the weekend zone. But you can see on this weekend one, the only little um, icon that's filled in black here at the bottom is S for Saturday. Um, that means it only runs on Saturday, not Sunday. Um, so I'm going to go back to the weekday zone because today is a weekday and I'm going to show you how to book a ride and I'm going to book it in the John Bear Road zone. So you can see that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday are filled in across the bottom of the screen. So I'm going to just tap inside the map zone and that's going to bring me pull up a different page where I can enter my pickup spot and you can see it's already using my phone's location to put me here at one 1111 Main Street in Conway. But I can't book a ride from Conway to, to another point in the John Bear Road Zone. So I'm going to change my pickup address to the Cartai Cancer Center um, that is off Cartai Way in Little Rock. And then I'm going to set my drop off address for the Walmart that's at Shackleford Crossing, which both of those are in the John Bear Road Zone. 
So then you can see I have these choices up here at the top underneath the where I put the addresses where it says uh, has a little icon of a person. It says one. There's a little wheelchair and it says not requested. And there's a little bike and it says not requested. You can change these settings as they apply to you. If you're using a wheelchair and you know that you need to have wheelchair accessibility, you can just change that to required. Um, if you have a bike that you need to load on the bike racks and these vehicles do have bike racks, you can put that on there and change it for you. But um, I'm going to leave that as is for right now and then I can just press this green request ride, ride button at the bottom. And when that happens, it's just confirming that I'm only booking the ride for me. If I wanted to change that one at the top, I could just click on it and up it up to, um, I think, six other people other than me because the vehicle can accommodate seven. So I'm going to go ahead and click confirm. And then it's going to do this um, pin setting. If I kind of pull this down a little bit, you see Car Tie Way is labeled there as the road. Um, if you're, for example, booking this from Hendrix and you're in a building that is surrounded by streets on all four sides, you're probably going to want to set your pin and pay more attention because you're going to want to tell the driver, I'm coming out the east side of the doors facing this street, you know, that kind of thing. So it's just like setting a pin in Uber or Lyft if you've ever used that. So I'm going to go ahead and confirm that. And when I confirmed it, it's booking my ride. But it's actually booking it right now. And you can see it says my estimated drop-off time is 620 or 620, 620 between 620 and 623. Um, right now it's 608. So that's not a bad total wait and travel time for my drop-off. But I'm going to go ahead and cancel that because I don't want to be a bad rider and a no-show. So I'm just going to hit options and hit cancel ride request. It's going to ask me to confirm it. I'm going to hit it again. And it's canceling my ride. Um, so... Then uh, I'm just going to hit done, and then you can see I have a little alert here on me, and that's just, just another confirmation that it has canceled my ride. Um, if you want to click on your ride history, um, it'll let you do that from this me menu option, and you can just see all the rides you took, what time you booked them, and what time you were dropped off. Um, so that's pretty handy, too. And that is the app. So with that, I'll take any questions. Yes. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> There's only one zone for Conway, and so you can only go from any point in the green to any other point in the green in Conway. Um, and you can't hop between zones in Little Rock or North Little Rock. And the reason is, is because we don't have a fleet of like a thousand cars that can go all over Pulaski County from any point that you'd want to go to in Pulaski County to any other point. Um, and we don't have the drivers to drive them. We would have to be um, better funded to do that. <laughs> There'd have to be a lot more money for set aside for public transit to do that. So that, what we do is we built those um, zones in Little Rock and North Little Rock to complement the fixed route bus service. So they work, they're intended to work in tandem with each other. Um, yes, sir. Um, we have a code of conduct that applies to all of our system, including the Conway zone. And right now, um, a lot of the principles in it were written a long time ago. And um, during the right age when maybe we were a little more free range kids. <laughs> but um, right now that says that you can ride the system if you're six or older, unaccompanied by an adult. Does that mean that I regularly see kids that young walking up to a bus by themselves? No. But we do have a lot of school children, especially kids who go to charter schools, which charter schools don't traditionally have school bus systems. And so a lot of those kids are riding our, our system. And there are a lot of kids from the public school district riding our, our buses as well. And you'll often see siblings riding together, and there's an older sibling keeping up with their younger sibling. I'm the second of five siblings, so I know this story well myself. <laughs> so um, that does happen. But, um, yeah, that's, that's the rule for now. Uh, no, it's been a minute since I actually stepped on one of these. I was on one a couple months ago, but I don't think so because there's plenty of room on the side there. Um, the, the wheelchair area, when I showed you that photo of the um, ramp, it's it's just like a big open space on the vehicle right across from that ramp. So, mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Once they 
Two dollars per person per trip. Can't do it. <laughs> and actually, the, the, I'm glad you asked that question because um, this particular software, and, and you know, we, we are subject to procurement law like every other public entity out there. So we're not always maybe going to have the same system that we use to actually operate this service. It could be a different app in the future, different vendor. But for right now, this particular one prevents you from booking another ride within the same hour that you booked the first. So, um, but you know, that plays out pretty easily in real life. Let me give you an example. I just rode the other day with some people from North Little Rock. When we started our trip, it was at the beginning of like, let's say 10 o'clock in the morning. And we were going to go grab some coffee at a Starbucks. Took us about maybe 15 minutes to get over to Starbucks, maybe 10 minutes waiting in the line, getting our coffee. We had a nice little chat and actually started to run out of time because by the time we were finishing up, it was time for us to, we had booked a return trip for the next hour at 11 and we actually were sitting there and I saw the, the car on the horizon and I said, we got to go. <laughs> we got to cross the street and get that car so we don't get left because we're waiting too long. So um, it works pretty well. And um, I just encourage people that when they're going to book their rides to keep that in mind and just have something that is going to occupy their time. And, you know, if you're grocery shopping, buy those, um, you know, buy your uh, carton of ice cream last. <laughs> so. Right. Just just hour from the beginning of your of your first departing trip and then you know, then you can book it again for the next hour. So like I said, it ends up we didn't get to Starbucks until around ten fifteen. So really I had forty five minutes or less to make it for that return trip. So Yes, sir. No, it's $2 per person per trip. We did this for simplicity's sake. And again, it was the cheapest fare for microtransit costs that we could see in any comparable city that we studied for this the fare study. Yeah, um, no discounts. It's just $2 per person per trip. And keep it nice and easy to remember. Yes, sir. We, from our policies, we do have four and younger ride free, four and right, four and younger. They're not electric, um, but definitely the federal government's given a lot of incentives, especially with the infrastructure bill, to go to low or no emission vehicles. Unfortunately, right now, just as the private sector is being affected, and you'd be hard pressed to go and find anyone to sell you one right now. And if you did, you'd pay top premium price for it. So we're waiting to see the advent of more transit vehicles available on the market and perhaps be more reasonably priced before we would go that route. But at, for our big buses, we actually will be the first public transit agency in Arkansas to get five battery electric buses um, in the spring next year. So we're pretty excited about that. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. You, you could buy, like, if you $20 worth, it would be $10, $2 ride passes. So you could buy that and, and load it up on someone's account. So, for example, you could go to tokentransit.com and send those 10 passes to your son, let's say. And um, he would get a text if he had a smartphone. You know, you have to have a smartphone for this to work to buy it for somebody else. And um, he would just get the text and say, download the free Token Transit app, and you'll find your passes awaiting you once you download the app. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Um, actually, there. I'm glad you asked that question. Um, there are only six holidays per year where we do not operate service, and they're kind of the six that you would maybe think. New Year's Day, Memorial Day, July the 4th, Labor Day, Thanksgiving Day, and Christmas Day. That's it. 
So we'll be open on everything else, Indigenous Peoples Day and all of the rest of the federal holidays. So we'll, we'll be running, except for those six holidays. <laughs> Yeah, well, you would book, um, they would just book different rides or, or if you wanted, you know, if you knew this person well and you did want to book together, you could say, I'll book the trip. We'll both, you know, but whoever's booking it, if you're booking it through the app, I would suggest that both of you book it separately if you're paying separately because, you know. Yeah, it, it, it's a software system that runs on an algorithm. So it's putting all the trip requests together in real time. And it's spitting out to us in real time, hey, we're getting five requests from UCA. So head over there and then pick these five people up. And then this one's going to be dropped off here. And then the two others are right down the street from there. And then this one's over here and that one's over there kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. Oh, wait. <laughs> we don't currently have partitions. Um, we haven't really needed those at this point, and we do talk with our drivers and operators often about these issues to just kind of gauge how they're feeling about things, and we've been fortunate in that respect. Um, we, that's exactly why we have a supervisor and dispatcher. Um, the vehicles are equipped and we have, um, special codes and signals, um, with the technology that we put on the vehicles to send out an alert if somebody's under distress and maybe doesn't want to broadcast that to everybody, that kind of thing. So we, we, we have safety measures like that in place. Mm -hmm. And there are cameras and audio recording on all the vehicles. And also the dispatchers back in the main office can see where the vehicles are in space because they all have GPS units on them. So you can't just go off the grid out of this zone and not have somebody be calling you and wondering where you are. <laughs> and they will know where you are. They'll just be wondering why you're there. <laughs> so, yeah. They do, yes. Any other questions? I don't really know all the details on that because I'm not in HR, but they do check for a criminal background check. I don't know the extent of the criminality. Um, I do think I think they check for felonies, but I, they probably check for misdemeanors too, just anything that comes up. Mm -hmm. Yes. Great question. We haven't had to do that yet either, and we're very fortunate. But that doesn't mean that's always going to continue. But hopefully, hopefully we won't have a problem child situation here and we won't have to do that. But um, I, I would say this. At first, right now, it's small enough and we're a small enough agency. And you, if you think about it, Little Rock and Arkansas in general, I think is a pretty small state. It feels like everybody knows everyone. So I think right now the way we would handle that is if, if we saw that this was happening again and again and tied to your account, you'd probably get a friendly call from one of us. <laughs> to talk to you about your trips and help you figure out like why it's happening. Maybe you're confused about how the app works. Maybe you didn't realize you, you actually did book that trip. You know, there could be some reasons, but we would probably have a counseling session or two. <laughs> but please don't abuse it because we don't want to have to uh, nanny everyone <laughs> on that. But we will if we have to. At some point, it may be that you forfeit $2. <laughs> And then at some point, if it becomes egregiously abusive, we, you know, may have to put that code of conduct into place. There are rules about riding transit. Every transit system in the country has rules, and every one of them usually has what's called a code of conduct. So, for example, if you were doing something like that and you just, you know, we've, we've called you, we've talked to you a lot, 
at some point we might you might get a transit suspension and maybe it's just for a week at first but maybe if it keeps going it's longer it just kind of depends on the degree of the infraction any other questions yes So basically, it's not a pass that's like for multiple rides. It's, it's $2 per person per trip. And in the Token Transit app, if you're buying a pass, you're basically buying a one ride fare for $2. And even if you wanted to buy 10 of them, like for your example, it would just be 10 that you could use. And they're not activated until you actually use it in the fare box, which if you're using a virtual pass, that just means that you're showing it to the driver. And um, it's, it's animated. Um, so it's, and that's to prevent somebody from just snapping a photo of it on their phone and saying, look, I paid my fare and then you try to sit down and ride. It's animated, so you can't do that. <laughs> um, and that's one of the fare evasion security tactics um, features of the app. So if you were sick that day and you had a subscription trip booked, all you would have to do is go into the app and then just cancel that particular ride for that day. And then, and then it wouldn't necessarily cancel your um, Friday trip. Any other questions? Okay, well, I am, I am here if, if, if you wanted to step up and ask me a couple more questions after this. Thank you for joining us tonight. We're really excited about it. We'll, you'll be hearing more about this as we get closer to the launch date at the end of October. Again, that's Monday, October 24th. And um, we're really looking forward to it. We think this will be a great for Conway and a great way to increase the mobility options in the city. Thank you. Mm -hmm.